So good morning. Let me get the uh, well. Hopefully this is going to work. There we go. There, our stream is started. And as we've uh, said, this is our first uh, Facebook day. We did uh, make some available on Facebook before, but most of those have been uh, uh, placements uh, from YouTube. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to be talking about herd immunity. This is the second video we've done on herd immunity, and herd immunity is a big, big deal right now. In fact, I don't know any issue that's a hotter political topic than whether or not it's time to go out, get back to work. Uh, we're going to go into some details on something that's very important to that issue, and that is... Um, are we developing a herd immunity? What does it look like? Uh, for those of you who haven't haven't uh, seen uh, other videos, we've covered several topics. Previous topics you see down at the bottom of this page, such such as a mutant, uh, more contagious virus. We covered that yesterday. Dentist office: how to protect yourself when you go to the dentist now in the age of COVID. Uh, inaccuracy of death certificates and the failure to acknowledge that. Um, whether it's SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, heart attack, stroke, the underlying thing that's causing most of these deaths has to do with chronic disease, prediabetes, the real uh, damaging pandemic that's been hitting our, our country, our world uh, for decades, and we still are just not noticing it. Most of us tend to think that well, it's okay. It's just part of life that you're going to, you might have a heart attack or a stroke in your 60s and 70s. It's not okay. It's not just part of life. It is very preventable, but you need to know what you're looking for. Um, upcoming topics next week, coronavirus, uh, probably in circulation before we documented it. And that's uh, something that we tend to see with most pandemics as they come through. We were not recognizing it earlier when it was coming through. Uh, COVID-19 symptoms appear to, to linger weeks after recovery. So recovery is not just um, like from a cold, for sure, not even like recovery from a flu. Uh, significant challenges on recovery after you've had it. Um, it's attacking more than the lungs, and we already knew that. For example, we already knew that uh, it, it causes some significant problems. For example, uh, it's very unusual, but with kids, you get a Kawasaki-type disease, uh, inflammation-oriented. Uh, There's also, uh, in young people, uh, as well as old, uh, major problems with clotting. Uh, we saw that with the young actor that lost a leg, uh, Broadway actor, otherwise healthy. Uh, again, young, meaning kid uh, guys in their 30s, guys and gals in their 30s, uh, getting strokes not minor strokes, major strokes from this problem. So again, we know the coronavirus attacks more than the lungs, but we'll talk a little bit more detail in that uh, next week. Uh, the COVID-19 comeback uh, is feared as states open up. Again, I know that's a, a hot political topic, as you'll see from today, from other videos, from that one. I, the science is the focus here, not making political statements. And uh, we'd appreciate that in the in the comments as well. Uh, rise of telemedicine. 
and uh, surveillance and privacy and uh, the challenges as we start to develop methods and apps for uh, managing uh, contact tracing for this new disease, the whole issue of privacy becomes a bigger and bigger issue. Just some quick updates we've covered before. Uh, remdesivir is the only one so far that's uh, got any significant record. Thir uh, third decrease in duration of hospitalization, about a third decrease in mortality for those coming up with COVID. Um, we've mentioned most of these others. We haven't mentioned cases in Russia. R Russia overtook uh, Spain, UK and Spain for the number two spot uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, states like Delaware, New Jersey, have begun hiring uh, COVID-19 contact tracers. For those of you who have trouble getting in to see a doc or, or getting through to see a doc, um, you gonna join us? Yes. Okay, Janice is uh, gonna join us today as well. Uh, for those of you with needs to see a, a doc, we still have some slots available on an urgent care type of basis. Most important, uh, one, of, one of our most important products and services, one of the most life-saving things is helping people understand that they have prediabetes. Again, prediabetes is what causes inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation in over 80% of us. People have uh, commented both back and forth regarding the numbers that we show right before we start, where basically we're showing um, Yes, we're calling this a pandemic and it's uh, with COVID-19 and it's consuming the political airwaves, it's wrecking our economy. And still, even during the height of this, more people are dying from heart attack and stroke. And over 80% of those folks originally had this problem associated with damage to the arteries coming from prediabetes. Over half of us, age 30 and older, appear to have some form of prediabetes. And that's from a, uh, a UCLA study done a couple of years ago. We knew, the CDC uh, knew that it was at least a third of adults um, prior to that. It's more. None, neither of those studies, none of that information was based on anything except fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C. It's really clear. Those are an underestimate of the problem. So again, prediabetes and unrecognized, unknown prediabetes is uh, damaging more folks than COVID-19 uh, ever will. So if you'd like to find out, we've got people that uh, are finding out on a regular basis. Yep, I've got this problem. And nope, it's not a crisis. I know and can learn and figure out and find out what to do about it and add a couple of decades of healthy life. Uh, some people have already gone to get uh, CIMTs, but they don't have a doctor to, uh, to help them interpret it. We have that service as well, and we'll keep you posted on our um, progress for the upcoming book. Basically, the bottom line on the upcoming book is, as many of us know, plaque is what's killing us, whether it's heart attack or disabling us if it's stroke. And the standard way of measuring plaque, doing a Framingham, study, which is not a measurement at all, and it's got its challenges, then a stress test, then going to the cath lab, and uh, then getting a stent, those don't work. That's why we still think, most people still think that you may just have a heart attack or stroke. Or you could go Tim Russert's way and get a stress test and it'd be negative, you think you're fine, and you die. So uh, the stress test is not, it's the standard, but it's not a great way to predict heart attack and stroke. Don't do that unless you're just feeling lucky. So next, uh, Carl will give us the water bottle and we'll go into the, uh, the program for today. So you decided to join us for uh, another herd immunity discussion, I see. Yes, I did. Good. Any comments before we start? No. I thought Chris did a great job with the slides and the information. 
He did, and he's using as you, we will see. He's used some of the slides that he did on the on the first one. Uh, the the wrinkle on this is to the first one that we gave was really describing the mechanisms. How does herd immunity work? It decrease the more people that have immunity in a group, uh, the less likely transmission will happen. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that more, uh, but the major focus is not so much the mechanism of herd immunity, but what the proponents of natural herd immunity don't say. Okay. And what does that mean? Well, the herd immunity we described the first time were based on vaccines. Right. And we don't have a vaccine with COVID. So Sweden, for example, tried a natural herd immunity, which we'll get to later. Yeah. And that's not entirely uh, correct. You look at some of the more um, transmissible childhood diseases like measles, mumps, things like that. Prior to vaccinations for those, herd immunity was uh, achieved right. from infection from the, from the disease. I'm just talking about our previous slides were based on vaccination. Correct. So the, let's go through some of the slides here. The coronavirus moved rapidly across the globe, partly because no one had prior immunity to it. Yet some politicians, <coughs> uh, epidemiologists and commentators are advising building herd immunity. Herd immunity is typically described in the context of vaccination. When people are vaccinated, a, a pathogen or the cause, the, the organism, the virus, <coughs> excuse me, cannot spread easily through the population. Vaccination levels must stay above a threshold that depends upon the, the disease agent's transmissibility. And we've gone down that road a few times talking about the r naught or the reproduction index. For measles, as we mentioned, one of the most infectious of diseases, it has a 12 or a 13. For uh, other diseases, it's very low. Once you start getting it below one, then the outbreak or pandemic is going to burn out. Mm -hmm. uh, for I, I think the important point is that the herd immunity, if we're talking about through vaccination or otherwise, is slowed down. It doesn't stop, but it's slowed down. That's a great point. So, uh, one of the comments before we started was uh, something like, there's no such thing as, quote, herd immunity, end quote. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's not true. Then I began to realize the commenters probably saying immunity is 100%. Yeah. And there is no such thing right. as 100% immunity for every member of a population based on someone else's uh, immunity. Right. And I think that's an important distinction. It is a, an important distinction. I appreciate uh, you guys bringing that up. So uh, this is one of the slides we used in the original talking about the mechanism. We don't know uh, yet how exactly uh, transmissible the coronavirus is. And here's part of the problem. Uh, it, it changes based on number one, mutations, which we talked about yesterday. Mm -hmm. Number two, it also changes based on the susceptibility of the population. So a population that has been uh, gone into lockdown is not interacting as much. So the, um, the transmissibility is going to decrease in that kind of population compared to a population that's uh, out, on, out on the streets, mm -hmm. you know, on crowded streets like and offices like we were six, eight months ago. But uh, as you mentioned, people with comorbidities <laughs> are more likely, that's why we saw this surge in nursing homes originally. And they are, you know, their immune system is more suppressed, they have other comorbidities, et cetera. But then the other factor is physical distancing and how that slowed down the virus. The nursing homes that learned from Washington State how infectious it was did an immediate lockdown and they got through relatively unscathed. So I'm just making a comment on both the comorbidities and the physical lockdown. Okay. No, no comment on that comment. Okay. I was getting a little bit confused on whether or not you were, you were saying comorbidities might increase. And in some cases it, it, it does. Yes. I don't think that's that much of a player in this, in this pandemic. I think the, the bigger player is 
unrecognized disease, people that have very few symptoms. Okay. But I mean, that's nothing but conjecture. That's just one man's opinion and yeah. you start looking at it. Well, I'm just speaking to the people that already have heart disease and diabetes and other issues. Those are the elderly yeah, in the nursing homes. It, but if you enact physical distancing and you really have to work hard at it in nursing homes, right? it does slow the transmission down or uh, forestalls it. Uh, slowing the transmission, yep. Yeah. Um, having having these comorbidities, like I have, prediabetes, mm -hmm. uh, greatly increases your risk if you do get infected of, of right. getting, if you do get infected with the virus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, of having serious disease, which is called COVID-19. Right. So um, we don't know how exactly the uh, uh, transmissible the virus is. And as uh, we were talking, it, it is determined somewhat by the mutant that, the we're, that we're looking at and the specific population. But if one per person infects three others, that would mean two thirds of the population needs to be in vaccinated to confer, confer herd immunity. And as you've heard, and Bill Gates has been quoted on this several times, he didn't create this. He got that number for some, from some other folks that for this virus at a probable, at a, uh, an R naught somewhere between two and three and a half, you're probably going to need to get over 50%, maybe 60% of, of herd um, in, of susceptibles, either infected or um, having an antibody developed based on uh, prior exposure in order to get significant slowing of the, uh, of the transmission through the population. In the absence of a vaccine, developing immunity requires being infected with the virus. But assuming immunity is long lasting, this means a, lo a lo large number of people would have to be infected to reach that herd immunity threshold. Moreover, the virus doesn't magically disappear when the herd immunity threshold is reached. The virus doesn't stop, it just starts to slow down. So uh, one of the things that you, um, that you might be thinking, I found myself going through this in terms of uh, transmission and focus on uh, what might happen. Let's say you take, you, you take the whole population, you slow down transmission. You know, China reported that they did that. Whether they did or not, you know, depends on whether you believe them. But even if they did, the question is, is that going to stop transmission and will it eradicate the virus? If you truly stopped transmission and there were no active live virus in any human beings, mm -hmm. yes, but that we've already seen this virus remain, even after you have the disease, after you start going through symptoms, you're still showing, uh, shedding live virus for weeks. So that's just not a practical expectation. Um, this means that herd immunity, each person will, be, will still be infecting fewer than another person so that the epidemic cannot restart, but the epidemic is still spreading. If COVID-19 went uncontrolled in the U.S., it would continue for months even after herd immunity was reached, um, infecting many more millions in the process. And that gets back to the comment that we had earlier that there is no such thing as, quote, herd immunity. And that's that's what we're talking about on that slide, that it doesn't totally eradicate right. transmission, even if we reached that 60 percent. All that would do is Slow it down. result in a significant slowing. Now, here's uh, Michael Alsterholm. He wrote the book, uh, The Deadliest Enemy. For those of you who haven't read that, it's a really long book. I've read it. I've, I think I did a couple of videos on it. Um, it's a very, very good book. And he's basically talking about uh, this pandemic. I think it was chapter 13. The quote that he got was from Rudyard Kipling. And he said, it came like thunder from China across the bay. And then he uh, did a chapter. That chapter was on the upcoming pandemic from coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So many of us have heard this. We've had ample warning as a society to respond to this. and. And when it happened, we didn't even have gloves and masks available, let alone testing. 
So we've failed in that area. It's not the first time the human species has failed, but um, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's an infectious disease officer for the state of Minnesota, I think. Um, his quote, this damn virus is going to keep going until it infects everybody it possibly can, Dr. Mark. Uh, Michael Osterholm said during a meeting with USA Today editorial board. Um, well, you know what? Every That's what viruses do. That's what any kind of parasite host relationships all about. But his point was it surely won't slow down until it hits 60 to 70 percent of the population. So his point was headed towards this question about herd immunity, at least to the point of slowing down transmission. That was what his his point was. And I think it's, again, accurate. Uh, Osterholm said only an effective vaccine can slow the virus before a large enough segment of the population becomes infected and develops some level of, of immunity. Even if a vi vaccine does work, he said, it's unknown whether it would be durable enough to confer, confer long lasting protection from SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes this bug. Some countries have uh, attempt to safely, end quote, build up population immunity without a vac vaccine. Sweden has constantly been listed as an example. The country has not joined its European neighbors in imposing strict limits on citizens' lives. Older people and those with underlying health issues are asked to self-quarantine, but schools, restaurants, and bars have been kept open. Given, given COVID-19's fatality rate, there's no way to do this without a large number of casualties. Sweden has already seen far more deaths than its neighbors. As of April 29th, Sweden's death rate rose significantly higher than the other countries in Europe, reaching more than 22 per 100,000, according to the Johns Hopkins uh, University uh, site. By contrast, Den Denmark recorded over just over seven deaths per 100,000, Norway and Finland less than four, Czech Republic around two. So again, that's um, that's our uh, our a great experiment in terms of uh, not doing not going with the lockdown. Uh, Swedish authorities, though, have de denied a herd immunity strategy. There's no strategy to create herd immunity in response to COVID-19 in Sweden, according to Lena Hollandgrad Grin the Swedish Min Minister for Health and Social Affairs. Um, Sweden shares the same goals as other countries to save lives and to protect public health. She said that in a, an interview with CNN. Uh, Jan Albert, a professor at the Department of Microbiology in the Karolinska Institute in a, uh, in a interview with CNN said, it's clear Sweden had more deaths than many other European countries up until now. And that's, probably at least in part because we haven't had as strict a lockdown and not a lockdown enforced by law. But Albert believed the majority of Swedish scientists had been relatively quiet because they thought herd immunity could work. So again, this herd immunity and lockdown is a big, big issue. Carl, are you gonna show the video or do you want me to? I can show it, Doc. Okay, thank you. A vaccine for coronavirus could be at least a year away, but the government seems to be trying to engineer the same effect with something called herd immunity. The expectation is that enough people will become infected with the virus that they develop immunity. This would stop it spreading widely and protect the vulnerable. Here's an example. We know that each person who catches the virus is likely to pass it to between 2.4 and 3 others. But if enough people develop immunity, then transmission is reduced considerably because there are fewer susceptible people. But how many is enough depends on how contagious a disease is. As this chart shows, measles is very infectious. One person can pass it on to 12 others. And so for herd immunity to work, around 90% need to be immune. But coronavirus reproduces at a far slower rate, so successful containment requires just 60% of people to have been infected and developed resistance. Now, taking the UK as a whole, that's around 40 million people catching COVID-19. 
The available evidence suggests 32 million or 80% of them would have mild symptoms. But that means around 8 million would, could have severe or critical symptoms and would need treatment in hospital. The government expects 50% of those severe cases to be in hospital during the peak of the outbreak, which is expected to last around three weeks. And that would put considerable strain on the NHS. But of course, that assumes you haven't isolated the most vulnerable people, and that could be crucial. Each death is a death too much, and each pe person who has to be admitted in intensive care occupies a bed that may be uh, essential to save lives for someone who has a stroke or, or a heart uh, failure or whatever. You. So I don't think we can let nature go, uh, you know, its game. Scientists also have no idea how long it would take for 60% of the population to become infected. That number simply hasn't been reached in any other country. I'm trying to turn it off. Uh, Carl, I don't know if you can hear that. And that shouldn't, that's never done that. I can hear it. Uh, thanks. So, um, <clears throat> start with a few comments. Cathotopia, my uneducated hunch is a very strong yes. I'm not sure about yes about what, but if not, bye-bye human species. Uh, I don't think it's bye-bye human species. As we've talked about, uh, getting to this, um, getting to more of a level of herd immunity is either A, going to happen with a vaccine or B, happen with a a lot of natural infection, and the natural infection is likely to, to be associated with a lot of death. I think that's going to be the issue. Well, and as we're going through this phasing in of relaxation of physical distancing, we're going to see how that, this experiment works. You know, what, yeah. what is the rate of infection? But even brought up in the video, well, first of all, do you want to be on the first wave of getting the virus to improve herd immunity? Yeah. We definitely didn't want to two months ago when there weren't enough ventilators. There was no PPE. Um, it's an individual decision when you want to relinquish your own physical distancing according to the standards that are set forth. But herd, you know, that whole herd immunity comes into play. And then in that video, it brought forth how beds used for COVID are beds taken away from other critical illnesses. There's so many factors. There really are. And I think a lot of people would say uh, in response to you, especially given the politics around this situation and the reality on the politics on both sides, a lot of people would say, you know, it's not a personal choice. I've got to go out and feed my family. I've got, economically, I cannot afford to stay locked up. Well, and that's what I said. It's an individual decision. It's a tough decision as well. Now, I would agree with uh, what you see with some of the layering that you're talking about. Um, yes, you do see problems with kids. Yes, you do see like that Kawasaki like illness. And yes, you do see significant problems with young people like the actor that lost his leg and the other young people, 30 year olds having massive strokes. But those are relatively unusual compared to those of us in the baby boomer population who have prediabetes, already have chronic disease. We're the ones that are uh, much more at risk. And then once you get to 65, 70 and older and you have those, that's the group that's really at major risk for death for this. And again, you're right. A lot of this is gonna boil down to some personal decisions, already has. Uh, this is the comment, D. Rourke, thank you so much for alerting me to a lot to the fact that a lot of people are going to see the term herd immunity as 100% immunity. Mm -mm, no way. Uh, Gary Marasigan. I think we can. That is how nature works. Sadly, another rule needs to be applied to achieve this survival of the fittest. If your body cannot take what the disease gives, you'll be taken out. Um, that sounds harsh, but there's a lot of reality there. Um, <clears throat> Let's jump over this. Robert Simpson, good morning. Um, Dave Murphy, good to hear from you, Dave. Thanks for sharing uh, yesterday that you're going to be coming in to see us and or we'll be seeing each other uh, uh, remotely. 
and uh, looking forward to it. Ivor Cummins had a good YouTube yesterday with Dr. Paul Saladino. Very interesting take on all of this. Thank you. Miles Harper, we were designed complete and fasting proves it when deficiencies are all balanced after allowing the natural process of elimination. Not sure exactly what all of the uh, your meanings are, but I will say this, one of the most healthy things that we can do, you know, they knew, knew it back in the old days, fasting. Uh, in fact, you look at all of the major religions from uh, Buddhism to Islam, even uh, Christianity, they all have a culture of fasting. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There may have been a good reason for it. Fasting is a very, very uh, healthy activity. It helps stimulate what uh, the balance in our metabolism going from an inflammatory growth kind of phase, which you get when you continue to eat, especially depending on some of the, for those of us who have, who can't, uh, um, metabolize carbs, uh, carb, eating carbs is a significantly uh, inflammatory process. Fasting gets us out of that and helps our body recorrect. So thank you again, Miles, for sharing it. Uh, my child is an example of not vaccinated opposed to other two. Guess who never has been to a doctor? My son was in autism spectrum, now a B student, and is now 10. Very interesting story, Miles. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Anthony C. Well, I just want to point out too that vaccination, childhood vaccinations have dropped with people's fear of going into the doctor. Yeah. So that's going to be an interesting. You were bringing that up the other day. Yeah. That's so uh, loss of this may create loss of herd immunity in the childhood Elsewhere. diseases. Yeah. yeah. Gary Mar Marasigan, here in the Philippines, we are required to undergo rapid antigen tests before we go back to work on May 16th. Is that even reliable? You know, it's interesting. I happened to see a headline yesterday where the uh, one of the, the antibody tests that was getting the, the, the most uh, positive feedback was that uh, Abbott rapid test. And <clears throat> the way they said it um, didn't sound right. Uh, what they said was, um, anyhow, let me just, let me just phrase this this way. It may sound weird, but it's true. As long as we have prevalence or, um, infection rates of two, two and a half percent in the population, and you see that in a lot of places, an antibody test, even with very high numbers, like 90, 95% for sensitivity and specificity, it's still half of the positive tests are going to be false positive antibody tests. And we talked about that in a couple of other videos. So let's say we want to get that antibody test and be sure that we're, um, we're not susceptible anymore. We can go safely out there. You gotta ask yourself, are you feeling lucky? Um, <clears throat> it's much more likely that if you get a negative antibody test that it that it is a true negative but in the low prevalence of disease very few people having the infection having the antibody uh, any test even a very good test is going to show a lot of false positives great question gary thank you so much for sharing and thanks for sharing that you're from the philippines uh, as you may or may not know um, Lori's from the Philippines, Carl is. We've got several of our, our Chris. staff, Chris, several of our staff over there. Uh, Poquito Mio, is COVID transferable through sweat? Don't know the answer to that. Have you seen anything on it? Yeah. I will say this. Here's the thing. Um, on a practical basis, and, uh, and I'm, a, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, so pardon me for going here. Um, if it's sort of like sexually transmitted diseases. Sexually transmitted diseases are labeled as such because that's the only way, that tends to be the only way you can get there. Now, what am I talking about and why did I make that, that leap? So let's go back and ask your question. When do you, think about it. We've shown where you can get the virus being on the other aisle of a grocery store. 
So tell me a situation where you're going to be exposed to someone's sweat, but you're not exposed to that breath. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. So it, it, my point is, how much does it even matter on a practical basis if you can be exposed just by breathing within six feet of that person? So great question. I think it helps help, helps us uh, demonstrate some infectious disease concepts. My BJJ uh, from Temecula, California. Thank you, BJJ. And I, I, uh, I appreciate uh, your joining us. I'm in the 95th percentile for LP little a. Uh-oh. I've been on PCSK9 inhibitors for two months to help reduce it. I'm considering also going on niacin. Do you have any patience on both? Any thoughts? Does, okay, thank you, Janice, for joining us. Uh, any thoughts? Does one mute the other? I don't. That's an interesting question. And what I've seen so far, BJJ, is um, sort of sketchy evidence about PCSK9 inhibitors actually helping. Um, I will say this, you know, there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of development just very, very recently in the, um, the anti-sense drugs. So uh, they're not quite ready for prime time, but um, would love to know a little bit more about what's going on with your case. How much, for example, how much decrease did you see with LP little a when you started the PCSK9? Um, very, very good question. And thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Chad and Melissa, when they have a successful vaccine, do you believe they will mandate vaccines to all Americans in the future and won't let us go out in public without a vaccination card? Well, that's, really more of a political question, I think, than anything else. But you look at, um, uh, it's not an unprecedented question at all. Look at the childhood vaccines, look at uh, the other vaccines that are available and how much we mandate them, what, what exceptions we have to mandating. As you've seen, one of our uh, viewers already has described not using vaccine, uh, vaccines for childhood diseases for his, uh, his own children. Uh, Joe Riley, BJJ, I'm on both. They are mutually supportive. My LDL 29, LP little a, from 450 to 373. So uh, my BJJ, I was wrong. And Joe, thank you for reminding me. Yes. But here's the issue. Well, won't go down that, down that trail. Again, you have to ask the question of uh, what's the uh, PCSK9 inhibitor for and what's the... Uh, what are the other treatments for? Um, so, uh, Jeff 911M, how many lives were saved due to suicide in Sweden because they didn't lock down? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, again, um, and how many lives were saved? You know, again, I, I'm not arguing. I, I don't think, I don't know anybody that is. I haven't seen anybody argue that lockdown has not been devastating to the economy and things that are devastating to the economy are also devastating to the health of the population. There's no question about that. Way back 30 years ago when I was fa uh, faculty at Hopkins, I tended to focus on that concept that we called in public health, a rising tide raises all ships. What it means is the economy, um, as it improves, improves everything else in terms of health. And so uh, locking down, doing what, what's happened to the economy is obviously not a, uh, a minor matter in terms of other components of health. My G BJJ super sticker, thank you very much. Uh, James Cantor reminded us uh, yesterday that it was looking a little bit garish in terms of all of the, um, the reminders on how to, how to contribute. Uh, so I've talked with Carl and basically what we'll do is uh, the banner once every few minutes and the, and the instructions up at the top. But it makes a big difference. Uh, we have, I've retired uh, a couple of times and um, well, even now in the age of COVID-19, I'm not going out and play golf much anyway, but I had not, uh, didn't have that much interest in playing golf. I'm, I enjoy very much being able to get these messages out to, uh, to help people with their health and um, don't want to burn our, um, our retirement 
committed to Janice that I would not burn our retirement uh, funds uh, making this information available. As you'll see, if you've been through, uh, through our, our videos and our comments, a couple times a month, we'll get somebody say, you know, Dr. Brewer, I think you saved my life. We looked at, I took those, uh, those tests, the oral glucose tolerance test, the insulin survey, and I don't have just pre-diabetes. I have full-blown diabetes. Um, actually, I saw a lady yesterday with the same issue came to me and said, I've been watching this on a regular basis forever and um, came back with a blood sugar level of 196. Uh, so, again, these are things that you need to know because they are not a death sentence. These things are treatable. They t and heart attack, stroke, uh, and I would say COVID-19 as well, um, are to, the to a huge extent preventable. Thank you again for contributing to that effort, BJJ. Jeff911, how many lives uh, were saved due to, I'm not sure why we're going back. Sorry about that. You and Osterholm are among the few genu genuinely informative and compassionate experts. Osterholm is at uh, Uni University of Minnesota. Yeah, SIDRAP, Center for Infectious Disease Research and Programs, I believe is what it is. And again, great book. And thank you so much, uh, Ralph, for that comment. I am, um, am honored to be placed in that kind of uh, company with uh, Michael Osterholm. Chuck K, Doc, hi Doc, when, we, when they report on Sweden, are they comparing total deaths or deaths per capita? It looks to me that on a per capita basis, Sweden's about the same as USA. Uh, maybe about the same as USA. I, they didn't do comparisons to USA. They did comparisons to other European countries and those were per capita numbers per 100,000. So I may be able to go back in and find that slide real quick. Carl, let me, uh, let, are we able to see that? Uh, yes. Okay, let's put this number up real quick to clarify. Okay, so as you were asking Chuck K, uh, here are the rates, and these are rates per 100,000. So as of April 29th, Sweden's death rate was uh, higher than other countries in Europe, not America, uh, reaching more than 22 per 100,000. By contrast, Denmark recorded just over seven deaths per 100,000, Norway and Finland less than four, and the Czech Republic around two. So again, great question. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to clarify it. Now, when I did that, we lost our place on the comments. Well, maybe we were, maybe this is where we were. Now, Jeff, uh, how many lives were, gosh, maybe we didn't. Uh, let's go back. Can some, someone show me a study that shows that a lockdown is more effective than everyone wearing masks? I haven't seen that study. I think it would be very helpful. Um, I'm skepticism, I'm, I'm personally skeptical that just wearing masks is going to do the trick, but uh, that's just one man's opinion. Dave Murphy, lockdown won't stop the spread unless you're willing to stay isolated forever. It just slows the timeline. No argument with that. And here's the thing. Uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about where we were a month ago, where, uh, you know, if you're going to get this disease and have to deal with it, and you're in New York, do you want to be uh, put in a hospital that's built um, in Central Park? Or do you want to be in a hospital that's got enough, uh, more than enough ICU beds, more than enough respirators, uh, systems are controlled, there's already been studies r regarding what's going on. So slowing it down is a big deal. Jerry West, can I compare Sweden with more severe lockdown strategy until the epidemic ends? must include health and economic consequences of lockdown. No argument with that. Dave DiPietro, hello, thanks for your very educational videos. You're very welcome, David, I appreciate that. Uh, Dave Murphy, sooner or later, you'll be exposed. The best you can do is make sure that you're as healthy as possible. 
No question about that as well. I think at some point you're going to be either exposed to the virus or uh, the vaccine. I am a little bit more hopeful than a lot of others that it's going to take less than 18 months to get uh, vaccine access. Uh, but even then, it's going to be one or the other, vaccine or the virus. Douglas Pohl, coronavirus is more than 50 years old. It has mutated many times. Yesterday, Los Alamos identified a new variant, D16, D16, D613G. If the virus mutates fast, can be uh, local can local herd immunity, uh, can, can you develop local herd immunity? Doug, I appreciate the comment. If you go back to our video yesterday, it was all about D613G and the, the fact and concept that it changes, it appears to change the, um, the spike proteins on the outer uh, surface of the virus. And that in and of itself does appear to have greatly increased um, the infection or significantly increase the infectiousness. In fact, if you look at places like uh, New York, it looks like the original first few days of uh, coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 infection were, um, uh, were, were with the old China virus or something related, at least the Europe, the Europe virus for sure. Now, within a few days, it does appear to have been supplanted by D613G. Uh, as described by um, Los Alamos. Thank you, is a very interesting point. Jeff911, are you feeling lucky? LOL, yeah. Unfortunately, we get a lot of choices like that, don't we? Jackie Shaheen, five, uh, five bucks. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you for everything, my mentor and friend. Uh, thank you for your contribution. And we will reuse all of that to, uh, to pay our Filipino staff, to uh, develop, to, to purchase software licenses to make this information available. So thank you so much for that. Felix Cat, do you think the eyes are a common route of transmission? I'm skeptical. Should we be wearing goggles? Of course, if you're in a healthcare environment and, um, and uh, you know, putting a swab in somebody and making them cough, or if you're in a healthcare environment and you're intubating people that have it, if you're in a healthcare environment and you're uh, creating sprays from drilling their teeth, all of those areas, of course you need to have goggles. But again, you get back to the question of uh, maybe goggles versus masks in a public environment. Um, I'd take masks any day, but here's the thing. Uh, so are goggles worthwhile? I am, I don't know. I will, you know, as you've seen already, I'm not shy about giving my opinion regarding where I stand, my, what I would think. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm skeptical that goggles would help. And here's why. I think there's going to, there's so much more opportunity to get this virus. Even if you have a mask, you're not so much protecting yourself as you are protecting others from your uh, your breath. Um, if you if you put on a mask, most of them have significant gaps here, significant gaps other places. So that's one of the challenges. The other challenge is um, uh, exposure to you know. So you get you're getting a lot of stuff from Amazon these days. You know, exposure from packages you get there. Now, are, would goggles help a routine person who goes out running or uh, goes into the work world? Again, it depends on which work world, which, which part of the world you're going into. BJJ, I haven't had blood work since COVID, so not sure how much LP little a dropped. I was considering doing N equals one on self and baseline of CIMT and LP PLA two prior to and after starting niacin in addition to PCSK9 inhibitor. Thank you for sharing that. So. For those of you who are not connecting, BJJ is talking about LP little a. LP little a is a known risk factor for heart attack and stroke. If you haven't heard of it, maybe you've heard of Bob Harper. Bob Harper was the 50 something year old um, fitness guru on The Biggest Loser. You remember he had a heart attack a couple of years ago. You may remember a week or two later, he came out and said, 
it was due to LP little a. So uh, one of the things that happens in, in uh, medicine is that we've known that it causes increased risk factor for heart attack and stroke, but uh, there's been debate over what to do about it. Uh, a lot of folks say, well, it doesn't lower uh, heart attack and stroke. I mean, it doesn't, niacin, for example, let me give you an example. Niacin is the only thing known that will actually decrease LP little a, increase HDL, uh, and decrease LDL. So you wonder why people aren't using niacin a lot more. I've got a couple of videos on that. Uh, in Europe, they still recommend using it. In the US, they're not so, uh, not, not so hot on using it. I still recommend it. Um, one of the things I was gonna say, Jackie, is here's why. If you're watching the inflammatory markers that you're talking about getting, plaque two, uh, uh, C-reactive protein, uh, microalbumin creatinine ratio, if you're watching all of those, you will see that even though you get maybe only a 30% drop in LP little a, you'll also tend to get a decrease in inflammatory markers. So that's why I tend to use, uh, that's why I do use uh, niacin quite a bit. For those of you who have interest in um, niacin and some of the supplements, we do a lot of work with those. Uh, Michelle is, after she gets her uh, plate, her desk cleaned off from a lot of current projects that she's working on, is gonna set up a, um, a session, a, uh, a webinar series for us to look specifically at um, supplements. We have uh, had an interest in supplements for years. Uh, one of the few classically trained docs, um, again, as I mentioned, background in, in the emergency department, as well as uh, faculty at Johns Hopkins and have been the director of many large uh, medical staff groups with 700 or 1,000 docs, but still very interested in supplements because the reality is the science does support use of supplements. Now, supplements are not going to get you out of a bad lifestyle. But guess what? Medications won't either. Uh, that's been proven and shown. And guess what? Stents and uh, even bypass grafts won't get you out of a bad lifestyle either. So a lot of information about supplements. Thank you so much for bringing that up, BJJ. Uh, and giving us a chance to talk about it. Joe Riley, my fasting blood glucose is 83. Excellent, that's very, very good, Joe. PCP, primary care uh, physician said, you don't have diabetes. OGTT with blood glucose of 255. Oops, my PCP was wrong. Joe, thank you so much for sharing that. And you're not the only one. Now people say, well, doc, are you bashing on primary care physicians? No, I'm not. Uh, look, look at the science. I've done several videos on the science that actually looks at your typical primary care physician's understanding of prediabetes, diabetes, and it's woefully inadequate. Uh, unfortunately, it's also the major cause for uh, death and disability in this world, even in the age of SARS-CoV. So uh, there's a lot that you can do to figure out what's going on. Joe, thank you so much for uh, sharing that information. That's exactly what we're talking about with the, um, the insulin resistance webinar, the prediabetes webinar. Oh, and Joe gave us a, um, a uh, super chat. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. And he says, I ordered a pair of swimmer's goggles for grocery store, $12. Uh, Bob Bell, deaths per 1 million U.S., 258, Sweden, 349. Thank you. We've got some really good folks that do a lot of quick fact checking, and that adds so much. So you get back to that. Um, that's an interesting question. Now, some folks would say, well, maybe you should break that down to New York or New Orleans and some of the areas that have had a problem. I don't think so because I don't think there's a comparable place in New York or New Orleans or like New York or New Orleans in Sweden. So I think you might have a very good comparison there, Bob. Thank you so much for sharing, looking that up and sharing. He also says there are studies that do not show niacin improving outcomes in spite of all improved cholesterol numbers. 
LP little a may be a different story and may be washed out in the large study. So Bob, thank you for bringing that up. I just redid a, I've got a half dozen videos or more on niacin, probably about four or five of those deal with the two, two of the major studies that you're talking about. One is um, aim high. The other one is HPS2 Thrive. Now, on uh, I believe it was aim high. Uh, the principal investigator was Dr. Uh, William Holden, and he said, I quote, and this video will be coming out in a few weeks. I actually took some of the clips from him saying this. He said, I hope, he said, I know as this study comes out, and both of these studies were published in the New England Journal. He said, I know as this study comes out, a lot of people are going to say there's no, no need or no place for niacin anymore. That would be a big mistake. So the principal investigator of that study said that. Why did he say that? He said that for several reasons. For example, with AIM High, basically what they were looking at was a very specific population. They were looking at people who already were on, uh, what, 40 to 80 of simvastatin. Their LDL levels were already down to uh, 80 or less. And in addition to those very high levels of simvastatin, if they didn't get their LDL down to 80 or less, they added, um, oh, I'm blanking on it, the, um, the other cholesterol uh, type of medication, the, the um, mm, somebody help me with, anyhow, very significantly medicated people, over medicated people in my experience. And then the question was, once you've over medicated these people, is niacin going to help? And in fact, what you saw was a slight increase on strokes for that for that group. I would never use I would never use forty to eighty uh, um, of um, not uh, simvastatin, and I clearly would not add another. I think it was ten of azetamide. Azetamide that was the other medication that was used. So that is a major stressor on your liver, major stressor on your metabolism. And it's all focused on LDL levels and very little discussion about um, lifestyle management. So, yes, if you want to just do nothing with your lifestyle and try to just burn this up with uh, way too much simvastatin uh, and, a, and a way too much addition of azetamide, no, I wouldn't recommend niacin for that crowd either. Uh, and HPS2 Thrive. The other, the other study that you're referring to, Bob, uh, here's the problem with HT, HPS2 Thrive. That was funded by Merck. They had a, a uh, preparation of niacin, which uh, had um, lepropion in it. As those of us who have taken niacin before know, niacin has a major flush. I, when I took regular niacin a few times, it felt like my scalp was burning off. So there have been a lot of preparations to try to get rid of that. Um, Lepropriant, which Merck added, did get rid of it, but there's, I think there's no question that the Lepropriant also got rid of any positive impact as well. So, Bob, thank you so much for allowing me to go down that bunny hole. It's not a bunny hole. It's a very important um, concept about, yes, so a couple of studies came out, and for the Americans, those two studies were, as Dr. Bill Holden, the PI of, the, of one of them, AIM High, said, unfortunately, those two studies are going to result in people not using niacin. And that, in his opinion, was a mistake. In my opinion, it's also, mis also a mistake. And you don't have to look far. You look to the European Standards Committees. Even the European Standards Committees continue to say, no, we don't rely on those two studies. There's been too much information before indicating that niacin does work. At the end of all this, you know, so as you can see, this is what I do. I go into the science. I provide information to folks who are interested in the science. When folks see me as a patient, they often say, that's all really good, Doc, very helpful. But what do you, just tell me what you think I should do and tell me uh, what you do. So I've, I've been pretty good at telling folks what I do. And yes, I do take niacin, by the way. 
But the other thing we've done just recently is developed a system where we can um, make it available, uh, uh, make our recommendations available to other folks. That will be a part of the uh, supplements webinar when uh, Michelle gets up, gets around to it, gets up, uh, gets it up on her uh, her agenda. David Ivers, PCSK nines. Um, PCSK nines are the 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 latest and one of the latest and greatest, uh, still the latest and greatest in terms of uh, dealing with very high LDL levels, and um, I have used, I've probably used those less than a dozen times and they've all been in patients that have significant FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. Now these are not patients with an LDL of, of 105, 110, 150. These are patients with LDL levels 180 minimum and uh, often multiples of that. Even uh, given what I do, as you can imagine, I've got quite a few of those kind of patients. Even with uh, people with those uh, FH variants, uh, we have significant safety up until they start developing other risk factors, most commonly um, weight gain and insulin resistance as we get into our middle ages. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Those, those came out of the blocks. They were developed about 10 years ago. A uh, long story about how they were developed, basic, uh, unusual, but a new way. They were basically looking at genetics that we already have available to us. Uh, they came out of the blocks like 30 or 40,000 a year. Now they're down to what? Just five to 10. So very, still very expensive drugs. Good question. Uh, Joe Riley, endurison, time release, no flush. So to your point, Joe, thanks for bringing it up. Um, yeah. I, for the vast majority of my patients, most of them have have uh, tolerated Endurison the best. Rugby and Endurison, R-U-G-B-Y and Endurison, the way Joe has spelled it here, uh, are the two that I would recommend using. Um, Endurison is actually extruded in a wax matrix. So what happens is uh, you your digestive system digests very small amounts, microscopic amounts, rather than getting hit with that um, all at once. Thank you so much for sharing and thank you guys for your interest and we will um, talk to you tomorrow.